further ado, I'm going to welcome up Jupang and run to my kids. What? I'm like, wait, wait, what? You, aren't you with your kids? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, oh, thank you, Athena. Thank you, PowerPoint and everything. But can somebody help me to press the play button later for the PPT? <laughs> Oh, I need, I need a stand, too. Yeah, if you, thank you. Stand, come to me. <laughs> I know, see, he can just step up just like that. I can't quite do that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hey, if we can have someone to help to close the door right there, and if we can come and just sit, thank you so much. If we can come and just gather in the center, uh, the two rows right here, we can come a little closer. That will be wonderful. Thank you. Go this way. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Then I'll just have to work, walk further. I'll make my round. It's okay. I can, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. So let's pray. Let's pray. Would you, would you just invite you to lay hand on your heart? We're we just gonna bless, um, bless our spirit and bless our soul, bless our body. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go, 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 go. Jesus, we love you. We are wired to love you. We are wired to want more of you. And we are wired to know you. Thank you. So, Lord, speak to us today. Lord, reveal to us today. Because you're always speaking. You're always revealing. Lord, cause your body, your family here today to be full of your truth and your revelation. Thank you, Lord. And, Lord, bless Juping. May she speak and share what you have um, prepare for her to speak and share, not a word more, not a word less. Thank you, Lord. We just love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ooh, thank you. It's always good, like when we were praying for, uh, we were praying for healing, you know. I mean, I thought of preaching with this on. But I thought that might be a little, you know, muffled. <laughs> so I came. My, um, I, I think it's really awesome that, that I was looking forward yesterday to come over to Sunday. Because I thought, God, this is a place. Uh, this is a place where you have marked your name. And there's healing in your name. And when you have body gathered together, I'm going to receive my healing, you know. And so I was looking forward. So um, we have an understanding in our family home group that, you know, hey, we know we don't want to pass on the, pass on the flu, pass on the communi communicable diseases, <laughs> but we can come to the house of the Lord and receive healing. If there's no healing in the house of the Lord, where will we go, you know? And so, so we are building up our faith in that. I, it hasn't been like instantaneous yet, but we're all going to walk in together. And one day, one day, we're all going to taste as a body that when those with the flu walk in through those doors, the name of Jesus will be lifted high and the authority of flu will be broken off miraculous, miraculously. I've seen it happen. So I know it could happen. I know we're growing in it. But man, it's so worth it to contend for that because that's who he is. We're all growing into it. Amen? Amen. So that's a good thing. So um, my, I just piggyback on top of that because I love to testify to Jesus. I love to share about what he has done. And there are certain stories in your life and in my life, like we recall all the time to remind us what he's like. He's written these in our lives, you know, in history. And when we recall it, we share it again and again. He doesn't change. I mean, he is... He was, he is, and he is to come. Even at the recalling, we're constricted in time, but he is. Does that make sense? Even as we recall, we're bringing his presence and his miracle back again. We are stuck in time, but he is. Past, present, and future. I remember the, 
first time I really significantly experienced this kind of healing in the house of the Lord was um, was several years ago when I was before I was married, and uh, I think Laura was part of the story too. I had excessive. I'm sorry, you know we're all adults, right? It's well, okay, except for Joy right there. Okay, some little ones. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> it's all biology, <laughs> you know. <laughs> No, I had experienced excessive bleeding, woman's problem, you know? Excessive bleeding and just would not stop, would not stop. Literally, there will be a puddle of water leaking. I mean, not, but except it's not water, it's blood. So it was really, really scary, and I actually got admitted to the hospital, and I got, I had to have two units of blood transfused because I was so low, and, and that was the experience. But I still remember the trauma of it, you know, just they call it imbalanced hormones where where the um where the the the, the female menstruation cycle just would, would not stop and which is excessive bleeding you know so so um several years ago um it happened again on a sunday morning and i always remember that it was just a sense that you can't control anything because when it bleeds it bleeds and um and my my husband was there my kids my mom was there it was just like Everything just leaked out all together at once, and it was really scary, you know, and you see a puddle on the floor, <laughs> that kind of scary. And then there's something inside of me that the Lord has given, and he gave it because it was so much fear, you know, it was so much fear. And I said, I got to go to the house of the Lord. You know, I could go to, I can call, I can call 911 right now, or I can go be rushing to urgent care right now, but I want to go to the house of the Lord. You know, he says he's my healer. If at end times, this is not even end times yet, if I can find healing in his house when diseases and, and sickness and, and everything becomes so rampant, where would I go? And I just felt like at that moment, Holy Spirit had given faith that I got to see something happen. So... <laughs> This is what happened. I grabbed a towel because I was considerate. I don't want to make the floor dirty. <laughs> and then just sat right in the front row in the main sanctuary on a towel. And, and that day it was a time of, um, I was piggyback on the faith of my spiritual mothers and my spiritual fathers who have contended. They've contended for decades before even I was a believer. So I was piggyback on their faith when they prayed for healing. And I felt like, God, I received it. I received it. I received it. And when I went to the restroom, there's like, you know, still like blood clots, you know, was in the toilet. I'm sorry. I'm just being real. And it was so scary. You know, it was like, you know, the size of the palm was a blood clot. <laughs> I was just in the toilet. I'm like, Jesus, you say that you're my healing. And that day afternoon, we were still having um, a meeting for some for summer conference, and and I felt like God, I know that you have given me a word. So I went to the I went to the summer conference meet, planning meeting anyways, and when I came back, I was completely healed. It was just like that. Thank you, thank you. And it was like, but it was not something that I was trying to make it happen. I was responding. Because I can be a Pharisee, too, you know. <laughs> but it was something that he had initiated. Like, Jiping, respond to this grace. Respond to this grace. And all through the process, I had a, I had a um, picture of what faith looked like. And that means, oh, I'm full of faith. I step in. So calm and so confident. And it wasn't like that. It was messy. <laughs> I was really scared. <laughs> I was really scared. There was literally mess all around and have to carry towels, have to carry this, have to arrange babysitting, have to contingency plans, what if, whatever, you know. And, but it was so messy. And I remember my brother Del, Pastor Del Augusta said, do it scared. This is right. Jump in. This is who he is. Do it scared. And I felt like God had given a measure of faith at that moment to do it scared. And within one day, everything got seized. I didn't go to emergency. I didn't have to have blood units transferred, even though the next several days was kind of weak. But everything stopped, and I was normal again. And I remember that, and I was just worshiping today, you know, with the remnants of this flu that's leaving, 
you know, I was thinking, God, thank you. I want to contend for that faith, that with faith, with, with, with flu, with colds, you know, if I can't come to the house of the Lord where the body of Christ is gathered and have healing, then where would I go? Am I going to spend the rest of my life depending on the doctors? Is it, what if they have no diagnosis for me? What is it, what am I going to do? Am I going to practice my faith for healing back then when there's no diagnosis? Do I want to practice it right now? You know, and I said, Lord, your name is healing. I want to practice right now. So I feel like, and I just want to encourage my church family. You're like me. <laughs> We're all jumping in together. This is a good place to contend. This is a good place to practice our faith. And this is a good place to jump in. Because he is faithful to who he is, but we are growing. In the process of pursuing the unbelief, the, all that fear, and all that whatever that doesn't belong, in the process of pursuing, because he is the healer, will break off. And that's so worth it. Yeah, so... So the key is that he is doing something inside of us as we pursue him. Amen? Amen. So I have a, um, I have a, a message of um, uh, reflection. And um, on the past few weeks, a testimony. And uh, in the next section will be on the Jewish, on God's appointed feasts. Um, I prepare some uh, YouTube videos. Um, and also at the end, we are going to have a response time. And, and the joy of it is that since we're such a small church within such a big church, we really get to be family and walk it out together. So everybody has a part. Everybody has a part. Amen. So if I may have the first slide. Ah, <laughs> remember him. <laughs> How many? I'm just wondering. Oh, you know what? They're all in Noah room. Do you know where that is? Okay. Lord bless you. <laughs> Noah room, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how many got to come to the heavenly man? If you can just wave at me. Okay. Great, great, great. Thank you. So um, so Brother Jung, uh, Brother Jung came uh, with the collide and He's such a petite man. He's like right here, but it just so he's just so full of faith. <laughs> I look at him, even though he's shorter than me, I look at him like that. Wow, spiritual giant, my brother. <laughs> my brother in the family of Christ. Um, so he, he is one of the living martyrs. <laughs> I guess that's the best way of saying <laughs> living martyrs. He, he came out of his um, just two minutes, for those who do not know him, um, Brother Yoon came out of rural China when the gospel first broke in during a time of unrest. And uh, when he received the revelation of who Jesus is, he just gave full heartedly to pursue, uh, to share the gospel. And he was captured by the authorities and he was tortured greatly and he suffered greatly. But God has given him the grace to endure to the end and he was able to come out and share all the miracles and the testimonies of what he saw Jesus has done and is still doing. So he, when I look at him and his story, I just thought God is so kind because while he was sharing uh, his testimony, remember how he came to know Jesus? It was because of his mom, right? The missionaries were were preaching, and the missionaries were non-native non missionaries, meaning they're not Chinese, so they had to learn Chinese to share the gospel. And lo and behold, you know, Ch Chinese is hard to learn. <laughs> so the missionaries, um, they, they, they planted a foundation, you know, a little church right there, but when the authority came and cracked down during those tumultuous times, they had to go. And before they go, they hugged and and, and, and they, they encourage the believer, saying, call on the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you. Call on the Holy Spirit. We will not be here with you, but the Holy Spirit, he will be with you. Call on him. But lo and behold, because of accents, instead of a shenling, right, which is Mandarin for Holy Spirit, 
you know, the accent became Shenlong, which become Holy Dragon. You know, there's a big difference, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, call upon the Holy Spirit is supposed to be the encouragement. But instead, the encouragement says, you know, so that's what the mother hearing the gospel, you know, I got a call upon the holy dragon <laughs> because of the accent, right? That's such an honest mistake. Yeah, amen. How many of you guys are like learning Chinese? It's hard to get those, right? So, so that's what the mom remembered. And I just thought God is so kind. You know, even through this, as simple as that, there was no Bible, no word of God, rural Chinese, but you have hungry people who says, yes, I want to follow the maker of heaven and earth. I want to have all the benefit of the kingdom of heaven. So again, you know, the part where when his father was dying of incurable cancer, mom took whatever word of God that she received at the moment and made all the siblings kneel down next to the bed where the dad was about to pass away and kneel down and call upon the holy dragon <laughs> because that's what the missionary had told them. So they're crying out, you know, Shenlong, 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 Yesu, 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 right? Calling upon the holy dragon, calling upon Jesus. And lo and behold, the dad got healed. And now she has a platform <laughs> because now she has a testimony. So she goes around because all the relatives want to know, how did this happen? And she just preached her first gospel, call upon the holy dragon and, you, and your diseases will be healed. And they all called upon the holy dragon. Guess what happened? They got healed. You know, and pretty soon this holy dragon thing got, you know, I was thinking, I was sitting right there hearing his testimony. I thought, God, you are so kind. You are so kind. We all know, so those of us who has been in church for a long time, we know what dragons are. It's one of those things that if my mom even heard about dragons and lizards, you know, see a picture of a dragon, she goes, shop, up, 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 in Jesus' name, out, out, out. You know, she's like that. She's an intercessor, okay? So... And, and he, God has so condescended himself to allow these lips of hungry people, you know, rural Chinese who's hungry for the truth to call upon holy dragon. He responded. And I thought, God, you are so kind. And, and but the thing is just that he is, he invites us into salvation, but he doesn't want us to stay that way. He Built, he wants us to be built upon his truth. I mean, holy dragon can only last a believer so, for so long, right? So, so eventually, when Brother Yun got a hand, got his hand on copy of the Bible, the Holy Scripture, he was reading, pouring over that because no one around him owned a Bible, you know. And he had to. He got this one from a missionary. And he, so, he treasured it so much. He's reading it. He read to the part and he found out, oh, he had a realization, epiphany. His theology just got corrected. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you before? <laughs> you believed in one thing and then, and then somewhere along the line, oh, I, I was wrong. So there was an epiphany. So he went to call, tell his mom, it's not the Holy Dragon. It's a Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. And this is where, where uh, <laughs> the spirit of religion came in. <laughs> mom said, what do you know? You're a kid. I am your mom. I'm right. And you're wrong. <laughs> and that was it. And all the relatives said, yeah, sure, you got the Bible, but you're a kid. What do you know? Well, your mom says, holy dragon, she's the one with the testimony. We follow her. She's older. And because of Chinese culture, because of Chinese culture, the truth of God for that moment in mom's life was unable to proceed forward. Right? She was stuck on the holy dragon. <laughs> so, but Brother Yun heard the call, and he said he just picked up the Bible. He just walked out. And one thing that really stood out for me is that he doesn't know how to honor the Bible. He didn't know. He just knew this was the word of God. So he said he held the Bible like this above his head everywhere he went. 
because he didn't know how to respect the word of God. And because there's a Chinese saying that says, there is God like three, like three feet above your head, meaning you know there is a higher power than you. So he thought, well, since that's the case, then I want to honor the word of God. So he walked around like this with his Bible. And that was his childlike faith in the way that he wanted to honor the Lord. You know, and it, it's his childlike faith that really provoked me. It's the way that he wanted to honor the Lord with what he knew. And the Lord just keep on adding to him revelation, teaching, foundation. You know, so on one hand, you know, Brother Jung, his childlike faith, and he was humble. He honored the Lord with what he understood, what he had. But the Lord didn't allow him to get st stuck there. He's growing. He's growing. But on the other hand, I saw the picture of the mom who, who um, love, who is so thankful to the power of God. But because of tradition and because of, yeah, because tradition and pride, she couldn't grow. And that was it. That was her platform. And that was it. And I was so um, provoked. I was very, very provoked. And there's a passage in John chapter 8 that I read um, this week. And uh, in that passage, uh, John chapter 8, Jesus was uh, talking about, um, if you have your word, it's John chapter 8, I think verse 20. Eight. I think I want to say 28 uh, onward. It's an account of Jesus having a um, conversation, a teaching with the Pharisees. John chapter 8, I think around 20, 28. Yeah, and Jesus was speaking, preaching to the Jews in general. But he turned around and he began to talk and address the Jews that believed in him, is what the word said. He spoke to the Jews that believed in him. And, you know, every time I come right here, you know, I would just highlight that, you know, and here's about a word of encouragement from Jesus about to, to be poured out. You know, here's all the Jews that they don't have the revelation, but there's a group of Jews that believed in him. So what would Jesus say? What would Jesus say to him? So say to them, <laughs> he preached a very surprising message. Bottom line, if you look at the subtitle um, that the editors have put in to help us to, you know, get a better scope, <laughs> it says that, you know, who is the father? <laughs> you know, the, 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 the uh, Abraham is our father. So the message, the, the account goes on that Jesus began to, to, to say to the Jews who believed in him, like, you know, um, you will follow me, you will know me, you know, um, blah, 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 blah. And then it got to the part that says, well, you don't, you don't receive me because, because, oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. The part that says, you know, if you follow me, you follow my word and follow what I teach, then you will be set free. Okay, so that was the key. That was a good encouragement, right? Follow me, follow after my words, you will be set free. Everyone says set free. That's a good one, right? But what did the Jews who believed in him, how did they respond? What do you mean set free? We were never, we are, we are children of Abraham. We have never been in slavery. What do you mean by setting free? And Jesus clarified, well, when we sin, right, then we become a slave to sin, you know. And that was a point that so offended the Jews who believed in Jesus, they ensued into a dialogue, and you can read it in your word, that section, that dialogue about who's, who's my daddy? Who's my daddy? You my daddy? You know, Abraham's my daddy. Satan's your daddy. No, no, no. You my daddy. You know, they, they got into this who's my daddy conversation, and bottom line, the, the Lord said, Jesus said to him, you want to kill me. The reason why you want to kill me is because your father is Satan the devil, you know, who killed the prophets, who killed, you know, who, who killed the righteous ones. You guys want to kill me? They go, no. You know, we don't even know where you come from. <laughs> you know, virgin birth, right? That's a stigma. Who's your daddy, right? We don't know where you come from. Jesus, I'm from my father. If, if, 
if God is your father, then you will listen to me anyway. So the whole thing exploded. And um, they ended up hearing Jesus say the last thing, and that is, you know, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, that everybody pick up the stone. They wanted to stone him. But Jesus walked out from this crowd, rioting crowd by then, unharmed because it wasn't his time. So I was looking at this, and I thought, wow, how would I respond? You know, the Jews who believed in him. Jesus pointed out one thing about freedom, and they have a stigma about what is proper, what is honorable, and they don't want to be seen as one who is slaved. And Jesus is trying to say, you know what? But you are. And the reason you are, because I can see I'm a prophet. I'm a savior. I can see you're in need of me because you want to kill me. <laughs> because Jesus sees the inside. But instead of responding to that word, they rebel because they wanted to uphold their dignity and their culture. Right? And I see another account later on in the book of John when the disciples were eating, the apostles were eating the last supper with Jesus. And Jesus said his heart was heavy. And he looked around the table and he has said, one of you will betray me. And what was, the, what was the disciples' response? Do you remember? They all asked, is it me? Lord, is it me? Is it me? You know, and I thought, wow, what are two different responses? What if the Lord had pointed out to me, Jiping, there's murder in your heart? Would I go, no, I know better. No, what are you talking about? You know, but the thing is that right now, a lot of times the Lord speaks, the Lord doesn't come, you know, not very often. He does come in the flesh right in front of you. You have murder in your heart. Maybe better for our application, you have hatred in your heart. Because in the New Testament, right, when we hate a brother, <laughs> that's committing murder. Right? You have hatred in your heart. Maybe he doesn't have to manifest as flesh. What if it's through a message somebody has delivered? What if, what if God appointed your mom and your dad to come and confront something in you? What if God appointed your children to come and confront something in you? What if God appointed a person in your life that you thought, oh, again? to come and confront something in you. How will we respond? No. <laughs> Who's your daddy? <laughs> I know my daddy. <laughs> right? Or do we come before Jesus said, Lord, is it I? <laughs> is it I? Right? So I, I, I looked at, I looked at, um, heavenly man, the testimony about his uh, mom, you know, about the holy dragon and about holy spirit and holy dragon, about what will hold us from being teachable. And uh, I realized offense is such a gift from the Lord <laughs> because it is a very good signal about something inside of me that's most likely not righteous is about to break out. So I can take ownership, acknowledge it, repent, receive what he has for me, and grow. <laughs> so that area of my life is no longer a broken bone misaligned, but it gets through a painful process of realignment come back and be upon the foundation of God again. So offense is a beautiful gift when we receive it um, and bring it to Jesus and ask, Lord, what, is, what are you doing in me through this circumstance that you want me to have alignment with how you respond? Because the truth is, uh, 
Jesus doesn't get offended. <laughs> he has righteous anger. <laughs> he doesn't get offended because he knows exactly what he's doing every day because he's completely plugged in, completely aligned to what is it Father has him do so he doesn't get offended. Right? He presents choices to everyone. So when we get offended, it's a good, it's a good time for us to go, whoo, that's a firecracker going off in an area of my life that is probably, most likely, 99.9% .9 unrighteous that God is highlighting to me right now because before I point out the log in my uh, brother's eye, I'm going to take a look. Well, not the log. It's the splinter. I, I got to look at my log. So offense, when we bring it before the Lord, you know, and process with him, is a great opportunity for cleaning. And the reason why I wanted to highlight that is as we approach, we've been going through uh, courts of heaven, you know, to repent, to cling, to cleanse before the Lord ourselves and our family line as we align to God's feast with the Day of Atonement that's coming up. It is good that we have the gift of repentance. And, uh, and this is a realization that, um, that when I was reading the word, uh, what a gift repentance is. Because um, when we think things just happen to us, we are victims. And victims can't do anything about anything because things happen to us, right? Victims are like, things happen to us. We are the sufferers. Woe unto me, right? But at a moment, we say, wow, I'm not a victim. I take ownership in this situation, even though wrong has been done to me, but I can take ownership of the part that I have done. And when I begin to take ownership on the part that I have done, I can recognize, wow, that wrong is a sin. I know what to do with sin because the Lord has made a way for me. And I can come before the maker of heaven and earth who has sent his son, paved a way for me to be righteous and to be set free. So I'm no longer a slave to sin, like the John chapter 8 passage. And I can be free so I can come and take ownership and repent of that and be set free. So repentance is a very powerful thing. Okay. So um, I have... The next slide, please. Thank you. I recognize this one, huh? <laughs> um, I, I couldn't find a very good picture of the photo that's outside of a church. Do you remember the front door? There's, a, there's an angel blowing the trumpet. Do you remember that? And that's, that's one of the key verses for Forerunner of why God has established Forerunner in this place. And the verse that is on the wall right below the angel blowing the trumpet. By the way, that's the seventh angel in the book of Revelations. Revelation chapter 11. When the seventh angel blow the trumpet, there's a loud voice that says, The kingdoms of this world has become the kingdoms of my God and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Revelation 11. So, when, just a little side note, I know if you knew this, but when we first were building the church, we actually got in trouble with the city with that verse. <laughs> it wasn't going to be approved because it sounds anti-government. <laughs> so, um, but eventually it did get approved. But, um, but I was thinking about, you know, well, Jesus, you draw us to you, usually at the point where you draw us is when we encounter you, usually when we encounter you, it's because we surrender something, right? We surrender something in that area you have invited us in, and we encounter you. So I was, I was thinking and reflecting back the first time when, uh, when I came to this church. Um, it was because, you know, I saw that my mother had faith that is so much greater than what I had. You know, I, 
was serving youth already at another church. It's not the fault of the church, it's just me. I was responding differently. So, but I saw something more that she had. She had faith that I didn't have. And I didn't understand why her God seemed so much bigger than my God, you know, and I was hungry. And so she said, go to a retreat, you know, come to, come to Forerunner, go to a retreat. I'm like, that's got a woman pastor. I heard the messages that she preached. They're just testimonies. <laughs> they don't preach the three-point sermon like the one that my church preached. I don't even officially qualify that as the word of God. <laughs> you know, I was, I was a college student. <laughs> you know, I was arguing with her, a <laughs> young adult arguing with her. They speak in tongues. Where's the interpretation? The Bible says no disorder <laughs> in worship. Where's the interpretation? So I had all these, you know, theological things that I was that was being fed to me, and I didn't think it through, you know. So I had a case against her, but she said, "Just come." But what I couldn't deny was just that she had power in her life, and she loved Jesus like a real person, whereas I pursued him like a principle. <laughs> you know, this is the right principle. This is the truth. I pursue and live my life rightly according to this set of truth, whereas she had a relationship and I didn't have, and I didn't know how to get there. So I begrudgingly went a few times, and lo and behold, I didn't know she was fasting and praying for me. I didn't know she got the whole intercessory team fasting and praying for me. Did I know that? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> so doing one of the retreats, one of the retreats, you know, when there was an altar call for uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, I was like, I have the Holy Spirit already when I receive Jesus in my heart. I'm a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, you know. <laughs> I don't need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, but, oh it's so good. It's so good. Oh, but they, they worship Jesus like they know him. No, I, I, ah, it was such a struggle. And the things that they have to have people come to the front for altar call. At my old church, in my tradition, that wasn't. Like, you don't go up to the front. The front is where the pastor stands. You don't go up to the front. Worship team is behind the pastor. You just don't go up to the front unless you're a really bad sinner. You, know? <laughs> you really need some serious prayer. Then you come to the front. So I, so I had that pride going on. I'm like, I don't want to go up there and let people see, like, oh, she is horrible. <laughs> you know, I want my face. <laughs> but the hunger just overcame the face and the pride. And back then, I honestly didn't know I was struggling with that because I lived with it for so long. You know, I, I, yeah, I just didn't know. But God drew me in the kindness. He didn't let me go. And I remember responding. And, and the point that I always share is just I literally counted the rows of seats that I have to say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Can I go to the front? Excuse me. I counted. There's X number right there. There's Y number right there. I have to say, excuse me, less on this way. So I will go that way. I remember all of that, you know. And when I came to the front, somebody came and just laid hand on me and I was not used to that kind of prayer, and they're going, -bah 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 -bah. <laughs> I was really distracted. <laughs> but, but in my heart, I said, Jesus, I want you, I want you, I want you. And I felt heat just all over him. I was on fire. I was 30. At the age 30 was the first time I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And and I just started crying and weeping and snotting. It wasn't even pretty. It was just like snot. You see people like Bethel worship, uh, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was snotting. Nobody told me about that. And, and the thing is just that, and the Lord is so good. He wanted to kill that pride at that moment so completely. I couldn't get up. I mean, I sh I'm sure I could, but I was like, ah, ah, and looking for tissue boxes. I'm like, what is wrong with this place? Where's the tissue boxes? You know, I couldn't find any. Back then, they had the projector, and I happened to be kneeling on the projector wire. <laughs> so they were taking group photo by then. I don't know how long I've been crying. And, you know, here's a group photo, and here's this woman kneeling on the projector. <laughs> and they, they couldn't take the group photo without me moving. So they had to tap me on the back, move the projector, get the string over, <laughs> give me.
me the tissue paper, move me out of the way, and I still have that photo somewhere. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but, um, but that was the first time I got filled with the Holy Spirit. But for me to encounter him, I had to let go of my face, that religious, pharisaical pride, that because I'm a coworker, I serve, I love the Lord. I was ashamed to let people know that I was not, you know, full of God like I should be because there was a hypothetical person, perfectionism demands, performing that I was measuring myself under. But when I exchanged that for who he is, wow, never been the same again. <laughs> <laughs> for the first three months, I, I remember I got called to jury duty. I just couldn't wait to get home. I would just, there's a rug that I made, um, put near my bed. I would kneel right there for like 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. It just, it just goes by so fast. And I was teaching. I was teacher back then. I would just pack up my bags and go home because I want to meet with Jesus. Because the first time I realize that, wow, he is real. He's a real person. When I read about him, and the, there are the red words in the Bible, he's speaking. It wasn't just history. He's speaking. He's speaking. He's talking to me. And one day, I'm not just going to see him in faith. I will see him with my eyeballs, my regenerated eyeballs. We're really going to see him. And I was just so excited, and, and that was so good. But I realize, you know, why we have to come and receive him like a child. You know, if you think back, you know, family, um, in one of the events that you have encountered him, that you think back, you go, wow, I met Jesus in this way. You can go back and think, what is it that you have let go so that he gets to come in? And that's always a good place. Because that place we let go, it's part of our old nature, our old flesh. And family, we fight with that all the days of our life until we see him. But it's beautiful <laughs> because it's an it's a offering. It's a sacrifice. It's an offering. We offer ourselves up. You know, if anything in our life gets taken care of, that old nature, Jesus wouldn't have to say, take up your cross and follow me every day. <laughs> take up your cross and follow me. You know, the gospel will not be denying yourself, right? Denying yourself because he is so good. He is so kind in him. One day we'll all see him when you have, you know, those of us, those of you who have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have not made that choice, it's not too late. <laughs> One day we will see him. So, um, so I have, I have some um, uh, encouraging testimonies to share with you. Oh, the reason Jesus, my only passion, what drew me to this place is because I've encountered Jesus as a real person. And, um, and coming to this house, I learned how to host his presence. I learned that my ministry to him, above all, is to, is to, is to make myself his bride, along with the body of Christ, you know, to wait upon him, to serve him first before I go and begin to serve with my hands, you know, and to care about what he thinks first before I do anything else. And I told my, my husband and my kids know this. I'm like, you know, a lot of times I will not do what I know I need to do because I love you, because at that moment I just don't feel very Christian. <laughs> but I will do and choose what's right because I love my Jesus. And I tell my kids that too. I said, you know what? A lot of times mama's gonna be like doing things that are wrong and wounds and hurts you. You know, that's not the mama that Jesus has planned for the family, but you pray because mama in that moment, her flesh might be so big, but I treasure my relationship with Jesus. You pray, he's gonna talk to me and I don't want to break this relationship. I will quickly humble myself than if I just come 
to the conclusion rightly after many days. So my kids all learned when they are just engaging with me and they go, oh, her porcupine quills are on. They learn to pray to Jesus. <laughs> and the Lord hears that kind of prayers, amen? Amen. And I just own up. I'm like, yeah, Jesus, I know. And here's, here's something on this side. A lot of times when I come to Jesus, a lot of times um, we really are very hard on ourselves. <laughs> a lot of times we, we really are. We think, that, we think that this is what the perfect encountering God experience looks like. If you ask Holy Spirit about it, he might show you something different. I was talking to, I was spending time with the Lord um, this week, um, and I said to him, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been so like, I felt like I got run over by a truck <laughs> this past few days. I was achy all over. I did contend for healing, <laughs> you know, and I felt like I just slept all day, and I didn't really spend quality time with you. And Holy Spirit said to me, and he reminded me, he said, I loved, I loved it when you come out to the yard in your pajamas and bathrobe <laughs> at 6.30 a.m. <laughs> before you send the kids and you were just walking with me. I said, I didn't do anything. I was just going, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> That literally was it. Even my dog didn't follow me. <laughs> but, but Holy Spirit said, I love the way you came. I love spending time with you. And I was just, you know, I just started, you know, tearing up. You know, I thought, wow, thank you, Jesus. You don't judge me the way that I judge myself. You know, you don't judge me. And I realize a lot of the things that I say, this is good, this is not good, this is godly, this is not godly, it's not even biblical. But that we, we're so driven to perform. <laughs> but when we stop and ask, what's it like for you, Lord? He actually tells you differently. He's not as harsh as we really made him out to be, you know. He really is not. He's righteous. He is absolutely righteous, and he's the great judge. So don't be fooled. We are all going to be held accountable before him one day. Every single word we spoke that we've not repented. And he's a God of wrath, too. Salvation is all about him saving us, not from ourselves, you know. It's saving us from his wrath. So don't be fooled, but he is not like the way that we measure. <laughs> so talk to him. You might be surprised. Okay, so um, i like to share, mm, gosh, so hard to decide. <laughs> okay, Ariel Hyde. It's, uh, it's the first, it's the first, uh, the first uh, video. About 11 minutes, is that good? Yeah, so I, if you look at it, um, I wish I knew this person, may he live here right now. So just coming to see Jesus with a brand new set of eyes, you know, and sometimes we just need to step back a little bit and, and see him really as he is. Okay, so if we can take a look at this one. Oh, sorry. It's a step. It's actually a video. It's not part of the PowerPoint. Yeah. So, um, should I give you the title? Would that be Would that be helpful? I have the link right here. Oh yeah. Thank you. Is that picture of him praying right there?
אז יש מנהיג יהודי מפורסם שהייתה לו השפעה ממש גדולה. כמו טרזר הונטינג. He goes about the streets of Israel and then say, hey, can you guess who this person is? אז אנחנו נקרא כמה ציטוטים שלו, כמה סיפורים עליו, ורוצים לשמוע מה אתה חושב עליו, ואז לראות אם בסוף תוכל לנחש מי זה. אז אתה מוכן? אוקיי, ננסה. קודם כל המנהיג הזה ממש דאג לחולים ובזמנו לא הייתה מערכת בריאות אבל הוא עצמו היה רופא אז תראה מה שהוא היה עושה. לפי רופא אחר בן זמנו המנהיג היה נוסע לכל מקום וכשראה את ההמונים של החולים נתמלא רחמים עליהם והעניק לכולם טיפול רפואי שלם ואף פעם לא דרש כסף הזה. הוא קיבל כל אחד שבא אליו לטיפול ובזכותו עשרות אלפי אנשים קיבלו רפואה שלמה. בנוסף אחוזי ההצלחה שלו בתחום הרפואה היו בין הגבוהים בהיסטוריה. הרמב״ם. הרמב״ם. לא, גם לא. אבל ניחוש טוב. שהוא עשה נפלא מאוד, נפלא מאוד. איש צדיק. נתן מעצמו לאחרים. יש לו לב ענק. איש חסד כזה שיכול לרפא אנשים בלי לבקש תמורה. זה אדם גדול. כשהמנהיג הזה פגש אנשים שהחברה דחתה אותם, או שהיו נחשבים לאנשים רעים, הוא בעצם ראה אותם בצורה אחרת לגמרי. ותמיד חיפש את הדרך uh, לעזור להם לצאת מהמצב שלהם ולקבל חיים יותר מלאים במשמעות. כשאנשים מסיימים מתחו ביקורת עליו על כך שבילה זמן עם אנשים מרקעים לא ראויים, הוא ענה, לא הבריאים צריכים רופא, אלא החולים. לא באתי לקרוא לצדיקים, אלא לחוטים. ואכן, אינספור אנשים העידו על כך שהוא עזר להם להתחיל חיים חדשים. למשל, מוכס מושחת אחד אחרי שהוא נפגש עם אותו מנהיג. היא תתרום חצי מנכסיו לעניים. ולהחזיר לכל אחד פי ארבע ממה שלקח שלא כדין. אני חושבת שזה ממש מרשים שמנהיג יכול להרשות לעצמו להתעסק באנשים האלה. הוא רדף צדק. מה שלא קורה פה. אנחנו צריכים כאלה בדור שלנו. אחד כזה הוא כמו משיח, שעוזר להם שנקלעו למצב הקשה. ואני חושב שהוא ראוי לכל מילה טובה עליו. זה מידה של צדיקות. יש פה עניין של עניינים רוחניים, שהוא קרב אנשים ליהדות. נשמע אחלה מנהיג. המנהיג הזה גם הדגיש את החשיבות של יושר. הוא הוכיח את המנהיגים הפוליטיים והדתיים של יומו על הצביעות והשחיתות שלהם. אוי לכם צבועים כי מתארים אתם את הכוס ואת הקערה מבחוץ. בתוכן מלא גזל ותאפתנות. מבחוץ אתם נראים צדיקים לעיני הבריות, אך בפנים מלאי צביעות ועוול. כלומר, לא רק להיראות צדיקים מבחוץ, אלא גם שמה שהכי חשוב זה מה שבפנים. צריך להיות טוב מבפנים, yeah. אבל... Uh... היום האנשים מושחתים לגמרי, אף אחד לא נראה לי באמת טוב מבפנים. זה גם בין החרדים. המציאות של שנאת חינם לא תוקנה עדיין, ואלה אנחנו ממשיכים לסבול מזה. כל אחד עם האגו שלו... את מי הוא מאשים פה? הוא מאשים עדיין את כל הצדדים. זה נשמע אקטואלי. זה ממשיך את מה שאני חושב לגבי אדם הגדול שמדובר עליו. מאוד מסקרן אותי לדעת מי האדם הזה היה. הייתה למנהיג הזה גם התפיסה של מנהיגות שונה לגמרי ממה שיש לרוב האנשים. הוא בעצם לימד שהדרך למעלה להיות מישהו גדול זה לא לדרוך על אחרים, אלא לעזור להם ולתמוך בהם. הנה הציטוט שלו. אתם יודעים שאלה הנחשבים למושלים בגויים רודים בהם. והגדולים שבהם שולטים בהם, אבל לא יהיה כך בעיניכם. להפך, מי שרוצה להיות גדול בכם, צריך להיות לכם למשרת. ומי שרוצה להיות ראשון ביניכם, יהיה עבד לכל. זה ציטוטים אחרים. זה ציטוטים אחרים. הוא צודק. בן אדם שדורך על אחרים הוא לא מנהיג. מה, כמו בגין שהיה, שירד אל העם? בתור אחד שאין לה ביטחון עצמי, אני חושב שכן צריכים להרים את האנשים האלה ולתת להם לעלות להם על האימון. ולהאמין בהם. זו התפיסה היהודית המושלמת, האולטימטיבית, כן. הוא לא רק דיבר על להיות מנהיג שמשרת, אלא הוא גם הדגים את זה בחייו. ביומו האורחים היו נכנסים לבית והרגליים שלהם היו מלוכלכות מכל העפר והאבק וכל זה. אז עבד היה רוחץ את הרגליים שלהם. אבל פעם זה, זה מה שקרה. פעם המנהיג התארח בסעודת פסח, אך לפי אחד מהאורחים, בתחילת הסדר, המנהיג הפתיע את כולם כאשר... הוא קם מן הסעודה, לקח מגבת וחגר את עצמו. יצק מים בקערה, והחל לרחוץ את רגלי האורחים ולנגבם במגבת, שהיה חבור בה. זו תכונה חשובה במנהיגות, לא להיות מתנשא. אין לו, אין לו קטע של גאוות יתר והתנשאות. ביטול עצמי, הכנעה, מה, מה יש פה לדבר? כמו משה רבנו, שהיה עומד עליהם לשרת אותם. גם פה, בגלל מעשים כאלה בדיוק, 
הם היו מנהיגים גדולים שמדברים עליהם גם אחר כך. לראות כזה אישיות גדולה עושה כזה דבר, לא זכיתי. אולי, מי יודע, במה שנשאר לי, אולי. הלוואי והייתי מכירה את הבן אדם הזה, שיחיה כאן עכשיו. תשמע, זה נשמע דמות מאוד מאוד מעניינת, ואני מתחיל להסתכן יותר ויותר מי היה האיש הזה. שמעת כמה ציטוטים, סיפורים על אותו מנהיג? מה את חושבת עליו בסך הכל? יש לו לב זהב, ובאמת בן אדם נדיר. בסיכום שלי אני חושב שמדובר על אדם גדול. מבחינה רוחנית, אדם כאילו טהור. גם נדיב, גם צדיק, גם יורד לעם, גם מרפס את עצמו הכי נמוך שאפשר. זה תכונות אה, עם הרבה חוכמה ועם הרבה שכל ישר. אני חושבת שייקח ל, לבני אדם הרבה זמן של עבודה עצמית כדי להגיע לרמה כזאת. נשמע בן אדם טוב, הוא לא נשמע כל כך בן אדם. כאילו, קשה לי להאמין שהיה או שיש בן אדם אחד שהוא כל זה. ואם כן, כל הכבוד לו. זה פשוט תכונות אלוהיות שלרוב מייחסים אליהן אותם לאלוהים. אהבת ישראל שלו למעלה מן המשוער, אהבת ישראל של יהודי צדיק, של יהודי צדיק. עם הרבה 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 אהבת ישראל ולב גדול. שזה נשמע יותר מדי בעיניי כמו המשיח. מי הבחור הזה ואם הוא חי עכשיו? הרצה, באמת. מי זה יכול להיות? עכשיו מגיעים לשאלה הגדולה, מי אתן חושבות שזה? הייתי הולך על הרמב״ם. הרמב״ם? לא. את יכולת מה, את מגנדי או משהו? זה לא סוקרטס כאן. איש תנכי אולי. אני צריכה אות ראשונה ואני אדע. אני לא יודעת. אין לי מושג על מי מדובר פה, אם זה דמות כזאת או כזאת, אין לי מושג. לא מכיר אף סיפור פה. נשמע לי כבר מוכר, אני יודעת אם פה יכולים לדבר. כי זה ציטוט שלדעתי, אם אני זוכר, הוא מהברית החדשה. אני חושבת שזה ישו. מי שזה היה זה ישוע, שרוב העם שלנו היום מכיר אותו כישו. אבל uh, בעצם השם האמיתי שלו זה, זה ישוע. האם כך uh, דמיינת את ישוע? לא. כן. הגיוני, וואלה, באמת, איך לא חשבתי על זה? באמת, uh, אם הייתי חושב יותר לעומק, הייתי חושב עליו. לא מספרים עליו הרבה. פה. אבל uh, מה שאתה כן רואה, טלוויזיה וסרטים ומסביב וכאלה. תרים אותו בתור בן אדם מושלם. אם יהושע היה כזה, אז הוא גם גד, גדול מהחיים, וזה בסדר גמור. אולי כדאי לבחון מחדש אם, אם יש לנו את התפיסה שלא רוצים ללמוד שום דבר ממנו? בפירוש לא. בפירוש לא אין לנו שום דבר ללמוד מהתפיסה הזאת. וואו. זאת אומרת, זו התפיסה היהודית המושלמת, האולטימטיבית, כן. רגע, רגע, אתה אמרת לפני רגע שאתה תיתן לי... שאתה תיתן לי... אתה אמרת לפני רגע שאתה תיתן לי לדבר. אהבת ישראל שלו למעלה מן המשוער, אהבת ישראל של יהודי צדיק, של יהודי צדיק. היו uh, תשעה עדי ראייה יהודים שחיו כאן בארץ ישראל, שהכירו אותו אישית, שחיו אותו למשך מספר שנים, והם אלו שבעצם uh, נתנו לנו את כל הציטוטים, כל הסיפורים על מה, ש, מה שהוא עשה. למשך המאה האחרונה, uh, מאות אלפי יהודים, כולל פרופסורים, כולל רבנים, כולל גם חילוניים, התחילו לחקור מחדש מי ישוע באמת היה. ומבוסס על המילים שלו ועל מה שהוא באמת עשה ואמר, והם הגיעו למסקנות מפתיעות. הנה אחד. דוקטור יוסף קלאוסנר, פרופסור להיסטוריה באוניברסיטה העברית, חקר את חייו של ישוע. והגיע למסקנה שהוא היהודי, היהודי מכולם, אפילו יותר יהודי מהלל. הוא נולד כיהודי, הוא חי את חייו כיהודי, והוא גם נהרג כיהודי. ובעצם הוא עצמו אמר שהוא לא בא כדי לייסד דת חדשה, הנה, הנה הציטוט שלו. אל תחשבו שבאתי לבטל את התורה או את הנביאים, לא באתי לבטל כי אם לקיים. פנחס לפיד, היסטוריון יהודי דתי, אמר על ישוע, ישוע נאמן לתורה לחלוטין, כפי שאני מקווה להיות. אני סבור כי ישוע אפילו היה נאמן יותר לתורה ממני, יהודי דתי. זה, זה נשמע לכם כמו מישהו שבא כדי להקים דת חדשה, או מישהו שהיה נאמן לאלוהי ישראל? האפשרות השנייה, נאמן לאלוהי ישראל, כן. חלק גדול מהעם שלנו היום... מכיר את, את ישוע כמישהו שגרם לרדיפות או דברים כאלה כלפי העם שלנו, אבל לאור מה שקראת עכשיו, כל מה שהוא הדגיש... הוא לא גרם לרדיפות. כי הוא נתן דוגמה של אהבה, גם לאויבים אפילו, הוא נתן דוגמה של הקרבה, ואף פעם לא לימד לשנוא 
אחרים. האם את למדת משהו חדש מכל הסיפורים האלה, כל מה שקראת? את האמת כן, למדתי על יהושע דברים לא כמו שאותי, לי אמרו ולי סיפרו וזה. פקחו לי עיניים באיזשהו שלב, לא לשפוט אנשים על מה שהם מספרים, אלא פשוט לבדוק בעצמך. So, if we just look at Jesus apart and away from our religious lenses, apart and away from our own prejudices, we will arrive at the right conclusion because he is exactly who we need as a Messiah and a Savior. It was just so fascinating reading, um, looking at the responses you know, because the ones he interviewed, they're not believers. They're not believers. But listening and reading and hearing parts of the New Testament, each one arrived at the right conclusion. And it's like, wow, Jesus, I want to know him. I want to know him. And my uh, encouragement for us today is that even through, especially those of us who have um, grow up in the church, or we've been a Christian for several years now. Um, a lot of times it's easy for us to be thickened with a religious mindset when we come to Jesus. You know, it's, it's very easy. And I was talking to... Um, a seeker friend of mine, you know, you know, he was saying that, yeah, I want to bring my kids to church, you know, they really need good morals. I said, yes, well, that's true, <laughs> but let me tell you who's at church <laughs> before you sit your standard too high. All of us, we come to church, it's not because we are good, <laughs> it's we recognize we are sinners and we're in need of a savior and we're all coming to him. And no matter which areas that we're at, we're all running to him. We come to church just because he's perfect and we're not, but we're, we, we love him because we've been loved. So when you come to church expecting people to be saints, you are absolutely going to be broken hearted. <laughs> you know, and, I, and, 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 and the conversation went on and how beautiful, how kind, how good Jesus is. You know, the gospel is never how good I am. <laughs> the gospel is always how good he is. You know, so a lot of us who has been in church for a while, we all carry, we all carry certain baggages. You know, because we're here is because we love the Lord. And we are loving one another because the Lord said, these are also the ones that I've chosen, right? Siblings, you don't get to choose. Marriage partners, you get to. But once you're married, you are married. <laughs> but, you know, siblings, you don't get to choose. But when I look at you sitting next to me and you sitting next to me, I go, whoop, Jesus chose you. You're my sibling. Jesus chose you, chose you, chose you, chose you. It's, you know, we don't get to, if we get to choose who our siblings in the family of Christ will look like within a church, it will probably look very different from this. <laughs> right? But Jesus chose, you know, Jesus chose, and he is good. So um, why don't we just have maybe a few minutes? I wish I know this person. May he live here now, and he does live here now. So let's just spend a few minutes just coming before him. And so, Jesus, I just thank you. You are, you are perfect. You are wonderful. You are the light of the world. You are the great physician that never asks for compensation. You love so well. You lead by example that the world may come and know that you are God, you are Savior. So Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, 
would you renew us before you again? In the areas where we look at you through a warped religious lens, Holy Spirit, would you help us? Would you help us to let you have that so we can see you rightly? So Holy Spirit, would you show us even today what is one area that I have been living and looking at you through religion, through duty, through responsibility and burden, through fear, even through condemnation and bitterness. Lord, in what area have I looked at you through these lenses? Would you show me so that I can repent of that or take a responsibility and repent of that and allow you to help me to see clearly? And just allow Holy Spirit to talk to you for a few moments. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over us. We know that when you highlight, when you talk to us, it does not have the flavor of condemnation or accusation. So in Jesus' name, we just say the blood of Jesus speak a greater word. All thoughts and voices that come out of condemnation and accusation go to the foot of the cross. Be silenced even right now. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. We know we hear you. Thank you, Lord. And if the Holy Spirit highlighted an area, um, would you go ahead and just whisper to him in response? And just repent of walking in it, even if you didn't know before. And just ask for the blood of Jesus to cover you and ask him to give you a um, new way of seeing him that is founded in his truth. And I just encourage you, um, go ahead and just whisper. Just don't think it in your head. Just whisper with your voice. Nobody... Um, is going to be hearing you on the left and right. Um, but you just go ahead and talk to him, whisper it, and just tell him. Thank you, Jesus. For these things we cannot change because you do the transformation, but we can repent and allow you to come and make right in the areas that might have been um, formed out of just ignorance, out of wounds, um, out of our own sinful nature, and out of the sins committed to us. Uh, to us by others, or whichever way we take ownership and we repent 
specifically for the things that you have shown us. And Lord, we receive in that place your truth. So Holy Spirit, would you show us what is it that you want to give to us in that place where we have surrendered? What is it that you want to give us that's of you in the place that we've surrendered? you Jesus you may have received and you may not right now and that's okay just keep on pursuing seeking him he loves to tell you he loves to tell you because he is the author and perfecter of our faith and so today just another dot another opportunity before him so thank you Holy Spirit for speaking thank you Holy Spirit for highlighting Thank you for causing us to walk in your truth. Thank you for freeing us from the wrong perspectives that we don't need to carry. Thank you that today we have met you. And by faith, even as we confess, we know you are faithful and just to forgive us. And not only that, Lord, but you have refreshed us. You have planted us in you to have life and life more abundant. Yeah, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And uh, just have a two-minute, two-minute video I wanted to share with you. Lastly, it's about the feast days because we are going to have the Day of Atonement coming up. And so just wanted to have a, um, a kind of like a context uh, for that so um, so if you can show the two minute one or is it a, uh, one minute and 55 minutes it's the last one seven feasts of the Lord it's all about Jesus yes. 2008 Maranatha has been celebrating the Feast of Trumpets as well as learning about the other biblical feasts from Leviticus chapter 23 that all point to the Lord Jesus Christ but why why do we choose to celebrate this Jewish holiday? I believe this specific holiday has some very significant applications and insight into God's eternal plan. It was on top of Mount Sinai that God gave Moses the dates and observances of the seven feasts of the Lord, which are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonements, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. It is interesting to note that the Hebrew word for feasts is moed, which more literally translated means divine appointments. And more importantly, all seven feasts point to and are fulfilled in Jesus. These feasts are separated into two seasons, the spring feasts and the fall feasts. Jesus was crucified on Passover. He was then buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread and resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. Fifty days later, the Holy Spirit was given to us on Pentecost. Now, the entire human race exists between the feasts of the spring and fall, which represent the church age. The Lord is harvesting believers and patiently beckoning those who will follow him until the fall feasts come. These fall feasts are to be fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus. And the first of these is the Feast of Trumpets. And this represents, I believe, the rapture of the church. While the Feast of Atonement represents the second coming, and the Feast of Tabernacles represents the kingdom age of the Lord. We want to celebrate as a church the Feast of Trumpets. Jesus himself said, Behold, I am coming quickly. And we look forward to that day and welcome the return of our Lord. So that's, um, that's, that's depending, on, depending on what your convictions are uh, in the different, different streams in the church, um, different streams have different understanding in terms of when the rapture is going to happen. <laughs> but it gives us a very clear picture in terms of the appointed divine feast of the Lord. You know, they, um, God, oh, thank you. 
God has his appointed times. If you look at these feasts, which the Jewish people has celebrated year after year, year after year, year after year, it's like a rehearsal for the real thing. You know, Jesus came in the first part, all of it, each single one is fulfilled right on the dot. It's right on the feast days. So it gives us that confidence in different parts of the word that he will also come on those feast days. It, you know, the word says we don't know the exact date, date and times. It's true. We know, you know, we have reason to believe that it's going to be upon those feast days, but we don't know what year, <laughs> you know. So when we rehearse, we come together to celebrate the Feast of the Trumpets, the Atonement Tabernacle. We're rehearsing. We're rehearsing for his second coming. We are reminding ourselves, you know, family, he is coming again. So, uh, so this is the reason why Forerunner, as a church body right here, joined with many other bodies of believers, are walking in and learning to celebrate the divine appointments, divine feasts. So coming Tuesday right here, it's going to be the Day of Atonement. There's going to be a gathering at 730. And the next, um, the two weeks out, not next week, but the week after, it's going to be the worship service for the Feast of the Tabernacle. All right, so Lord bless you. Amen. Oh, and, and the, the paper, <laughs> we didn't get a chance to do, but if you can today, um, if you can today, um, even be with your family to pray over this, over your finances, over your finances, bef uh, 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 and take care of it before the Lord as a family unit, it will be a great blessing to you. So that's what that is all about. Thank you. Lord bless you.